Well hello, finally back to do the next part of the Beta Flight Basics, concentrating this time on the configuration tab. Sorry about you guys that were hanging there, I realise I've left this a little bit longer than I anticipated because I got uh, involved in doing a whole bunch of other things, but here it is, back again, let's go through it and finish off. So, configuration tab has quite a lot in it, and what I'm doing to run through, I've connected up initially to this Martian free build, which is running an Omnibus F free board. So let's jump in to the configuration tab and just go through what we've got. So I'm just going to take this bit by bit um, and I'm going to sort of ignore some of the bits that aren't as relevant and concentrate on the bits that you might have to change a lot. And the first bit is, for most people, uh, not even relevant. It's the mixer, how your quad is set up. And normally your quad X, but here's all the various bits you can do. Um, a plus, a try, but I think most people are flying quads in this setup anyway, so we'll ignore that. So more interesting than this is moving over to the ESC and what this is all about. So this quad is set up with ESCs used DSHOT 600, which is the new digital protocol. I say it's the new digital protocol. It's the new one as of a while ago, and they're already on to DSHOT 1200, and there's probably more stuff coming out. Stuff comes out every week. So. If you look at the drop down list, you've got kind of worse to bad. In the olden days, we had PWM, which is the traditional old signal that has been around for a long time, talking to the ESCs, and it's a slow protocol. So one of the biggest upgrades you could have done was the move from PPM to OneShot125. So if you have an ESC that at least supports OneShot125, use it over PWM, please. Because the jump from PWM to one, uh, one shot 125 is quite noticeable and much smoother. Basically, you get a lot more uh, signals. Basically, it's faster. ESC, uh, flight control talks to ESC, ESC talks to the motor. Uh, and you will just end up with a smoother flight. Now, above that, I'm going to say that I don't notice that much difference. So, yeah, there's a big jump from PWM to a one shot 125. But the next levels of stuff are little tiny jumps, and I think you'd be hard pushed to notice it, because I really can't on a quad that already flies well on OneShot125. Moving up to something on a faster protocol, OneShot42, Multishot, um, even DShot, I don't notice a difference. So yeah, if you can do OneShot125, that's a good start. So don't feel bad that like, oh no, I can't do multi-shot or I can't do D-shot because you're still going to get a good experience. The only thing I'd mention about D-shot and of course if you've got the right flight controller and if you've got the right ESCs that support it, by all means use it because it's you know, it's a no-brainer, it's, it's fast and it works well. The great thing about D-shot being digital is you don't need to calibrate your ESCs anymore so that's something you don't have to do by using something that may be easy to do. So. If you've got it, use it, because it, it works pretty well. As I said, I can't really tell the difference between a good flying quad on 125 and a good flying quad on D-Shop, other than the fact you don't have to do this calibration. And I do notice that there seems to be more resolution in the, the low end, so when I'm pushing the throttle up, the, the motors tend to run slower to faster in a smoother way. But I'm hardly ever down on that bottom end, because of course the, the, the thing's not flying. It's that's when it's hanging in the air, not doing anything. But anyway, I digress. The motor stop feature, an interesting one. I always use motor stop because when I arm the quad, I don't want the motors to spin because um, often I'm in a situation where I've got long grass and I have to choose my takeoff spots and landing spots very carefully. And what I don't want to have to think about doing is disarming. I want the throttle down and it to go. Now, some people look at motor stop and think it's the same as um, air mode. I, if you don't have motor stop, the motors are going to spin, therefore I can do my various manoeuvres in the air and it will work better. Now, at first I thought not having motor stop would be spinning motors without the gyro being affected. So if you move your quad round, the motors would spin at a constant rate. But it's not the case. They actually do um, try and activate the pid loop. So I was a little bit confused about the difference to it. And the only thing I found about it really is air mode is designed to be flown um, in a way where you're going to have your stick all the way down and the pids will be more reactive, where motor stops not. So people have mentioned it's smoother to use air mode, it's better to use air mode. So 
if you want the motors to spin when you're on zero throttle, I recommend air mode over motor stop. I've got no evidence of using it myself, but um, it's what I use and I can put air mode on a switch that I can turn on off where motor stop you can't put on a switch, so that's it for me. Um, there's there's nothing too excited about the rest of it in in this section. So let's move on to the system configuration because that's kind of exciting. So this comes down to PID loops and gyro loops. What are they all about? It's basically how quickly your gyro talks to your flight controller and then that's how quickly that's going to talk to the ESCs and talk to the motors and the general gist is if it's faster it should be better. It's reacting at a faster rate and equalizing out everything that, that could be occurring to sort of upset your your attitude. This is again though one of these things that after a certain point the the upgrade in the performance is small small steps. Now I found as, as far as the frequency the PID loop frequency goes Two kilohertz above, I'm not noticing much of a difference. And to be honest, I've run the gyro update on uh, two kilohertz as well on a lot of quads because that was um, that was a limitation of the flight controller, and that seemed fine. So as far as this goes, you kind of have to check what your um, flight controller supports. So uh, an SPI bus supports up to an eight kilohertz gyro loop which this has, so I'm using that. Older flight controllers on I2C buses can only support up to a 4 hertz gyro loop and the new buses, which I forget what they're called, can go up to 32 uh, kilohertz, although there can be problems with these really ultra high things about having to dampen the board and stuff. The important thing to do is make sure your gyro loop is at least as much as your PID loop and it, or greater. Basically, you can't have your PID loop greater than your gyro loop, but aside from that, you're, you're good to go. The other thing to do is, of course, watch the CPU usage on this. By enabling features and having very high loops, you're going to up the CPU time. This is ticking over nicely at 17% with the options I've got. The max you really want to aim for is 30, maybe 35%. I try and keep mine under 25 because I know there's it's not ever going to have a problem. But like I said, you get your PID loop to 2 kilohertz, you're not going to get that much of an improvement that I could recognise anyway by upping it. Now the receiver is an important bit because that kind of goes hand in hand with the ports thing. And again, you've got a sort of list of worse to better. Sort of on the worst point of view, you've got PWM. Uh, and that's not necessarily about speed, it's more about wiring. It's speed as well, but you're going to have four wires or five wires coming out of a receiver linking to your board, one for each um, control input and one for your switch, which is just a nightmare on these small quads. So there's there's hardly any receivers that you should be using that won't use at least P, PPM or, or SBUS. So PPM is your next best uh, output and it's kind of the I'd say the older style receivers. At least it uses one wire, it's just not as fast as SBUS. And you don't have to do anything in terms of setting up a UART, so that's quite easy. Best thing you can use at the moment though is SBUS. And there's loads of different um, serial providers. For FreeSkies I'm using, it's the serial based receiver and SBUS. And then you're set up to go. Single wire again, much faster. Um, takes a lot more channels through there as well over PPM. So it's the one to use if your uh, receiver supports it. Just remember that you will need to set up a UART to say I'm a serial bus like I've got here. I've got UART free uh, set up for serial RX. So the other relevant things and this is really weird because this is not my normal layout. I don't know if I've changed something around here but everything seems to be slightly missing. You'll see stuff like other features and sometimes a whole bunch of these are actually enabled when you kind of don't need them to be. So things that might be relevant or 
might be enabled is black box. There is actually a black box recorder on the Omnibus with an SD card, but I'm not using it. So by disabling it, I save a percent or two on the CPU. Um, and I would need SD card there as well. So you, you might have relevant stuff like telemetry output if you were using the telemetry as um, an output back to stuff. Uh, and not much else goes on at the moment. You know, it says I've got an omnibus. The only thing I've got enabled is the OSD, and that's because it's an inbuilt OSD. If I had an external OSD, then I'd just ignore that bit. Um, I'd, I'd just go back up here, because another way you can save a bit of uh, percentage points if you're getting close is to disable the accelerometer. Because if you're not using any self-level modes, why would you? Then you don't need it. Mine's there because it doesn't need to be turned off. Other stuff that's useful, the VBAT monitoring, and most uh, most of the times you're going to have a main power connected to your flight controller, I would hope, for battery monitoring. If you haven't got an OSD and you've got a beeper, it will mean that this thing will start beeping when it hits the uh, warning cell voltage, which I've got here is 3.5 volts, uh, and it's got a minimum volt where it really starts going mental about it. So the only other thing which I think might be of relevance, especially if you've got an OSD, is the RSSI signal. Now, you'll notice this is not enabled. I do have RSSI in there, but there's a much better way of getting it rather than soldering through um, pads on your receiver to try and get analog voltage out there. And I'll cover that when we come to the receiver tab. But for now, I think we are done. If you do make any changes and you're not sure, for goodness sakes, take your props off before you try anything out because they can go a little bit mental and just make sure it's all okay on, on, the, uh, on the desk before you go out there and try it. But hopefully if you're just starting out, that can demystify things a little bit. Generally speaking, you'll already have a config on the board as it comes, which will at least work, but it, it might not be optimal. So you might want to have a look at it, see if there's things you can change around, especially if you're adding different bits and pieces, you've got different ESCs. Bye for now, I'll catch you in the next one where we'll take another tab and look into that.